Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, we probably could have been outside today, apparently, because the weather forecast changed in the last hour, but uh, that's okay. We, uh, we can do this. We're just glad that we can be together as the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So it's good to see everyone. Good to see uh, the Keski kids back, and glad everybody's feeling good there. And good to see some new friends with us today. Glad that we can be together in the house of the Lord to worship Him uh, and to lift up our praises, to be reminded of His love and His grace towards us. Uh, a couple things just to remind you of this morning. We are going to wrap up our final, we're going to wrap up our Confident Faith study this evening at 6 o'clock. It's our final video. And I believe it's on the books of the Bible, how the books of the Bible, especially the New Testament, got pulled together. And uh, then what we do with all the things that we've learned over the past couple of weeks. And then hopefully, uh, we'd like to have a campfire with a little dessert social outside, but if it's too wet yet, uh, we'll just meet uh, downstairs or up here. And so looking forward to that. So if you come tonight, bring a little dessert to share. Uh, we'd appreciate that as we wrap up our series on uh, Confident Faith. Um, starting next Sunday night at 6.30, a little bit of a time change. want to discover that we probably could use a little bit extra time. Um, want to give, start having a prayer meeting on Sunday evenings for about a half hour, 45 minutes. We'll have uh, a little devotional, just, just a few minutes, and then have a song or two, and then spend some time in prayer together. So it's something that uh, we have not had for quite a while. We're looking to get that together on a different night now, and we'll continue serving. Many of us continue serving on Wednesday nights at the pantry as well. So... A little bit different uh, change, so just keep that in mind. We will continue to meet on Sunday nights, but the Confident Faith Study will wrap up this evening. So looking forward to all of that. Uh, a couple of prayer announcements uh, just to make you aware of. Uh, keep Tony Tosinski's mom, Barb, in your prayers. Uh, she did have a heart attack this past week, uh, and uh, last I heard is doing okay. Okay, so keep praying for her, and also keep praying for uh, Brian Rao, that would be Mike's brother-in-law, Louise's son-in-law. Son -in uh, you guys, many of you know Janet uh, and the girls, uh, they come up quite often for family events and for functions here at the church, but Brian on Thursday had a heart attack, and so he's been in the hospital all weekend, possibly going home on Tuesday. Uh, there's some memory issues that he's still having yet, so keep praying for him, and pray for his girls, pray for Janet. They all try to figure out what's going to go on and what's going to happen from here on out. So we're praying for him and his health. Uh, I haven't heard too much more about anybody else you know, in the church for health reasons, but uh, just keep praying for people on our list as we've been praying so faithfully for the past couple of weeks. All right. Any announcements that I'm forgetting? All right. We will continue to try to meet outside as long as the weather is warm enough and dry enough. So uh, just kind of keep paying attention to the weather forecast, and I'll let you know as well what to expect. But I'm hoping to be outside next weekend. Next Sunday is supposed to be really nice and warm in summer. So we look forward to that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we begin our time in worship. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. This opportunity we have to gather uh, in, the dry, in this wonderful building where it's dry and uh, comfortable. Father, we thank you for the safety that we have here. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in freedom without fear of uh, government or others uh, reacting and responding to us uh, because of our faith in Christ. And Father, we do take that for granted so often. We pray that you would forgive us of that and help us to appreciate uh, what we have and what we are able to do here each week and throughout the week. We pray, Father, that this time would be a time where we remind ourselves of we are reminded of your grace, your goodness towards us in Christ. Uh, thankful for your word, your spirit, as they guide and direct us and teach us to live according to your ways, that we might grow in Christian maturity, being more like Christ, that we might give you honor, glory, and praise in all that we do and say. Father, we do pray that you would be with those who are uh, struggling uh, right now. We think especially of uh, Barb and Brian and their families. We pray that you would be with them, continue to heal them, and bring comfort in doctor's wisdom, help them to know what is uh, the best thing to do, and we pray that their observations and their diagnosis would be uh, proper and correct, and so they would get the best care that they can get. 
Father, we do pray for our church family who are not able to be here with us today. We pray that you continue to strengthen them, be with them, let them know that we love and care for them, and that uh, you are with them, watching over them each day. Father, we do pray for our nation, we pray for our world, we thank you, Father, for um, the relative peace that has uh, settled in for the past couple of days anyway, and we pray that you would uh, continue that. We pray that your will would continue to be done in the church, in America, and throughout the world, and we would be able to continue to meet proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as your kingdom is coming, continue to daily surrender to him. Father, we pray that you guide and direct us now through the time of worship as we celebrate the Lord's table together. We pray that you be honored and glorified, each heart will be touched and transformed. Stand with me, please, and we will recite the Lord's Prayer together in our time of worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
next point. Thank you everyone for singing today. I know for some it's difficult to sing with that uh, mask on, but we sounded good this morning. Glad that you were able to sing praises about God our Savior and all that He's done for us. Songs that remind us of the cross and of our salvation and the grace that has been given to us from our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. He's bearing our sins upon the cross. Coming back to life. Ruling and reigning in heaven. Today is a time that we also set apart the time of our service to focus upon and remember in, in obedience to our Lord. A time to celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, to partake of um, communion together. Be reminded that we are one, united together in the Lord because of His death for us. If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans chapter 6 for just a brief reading, a uh, little devotional about the cross this morning, what it means for us uh, as we head into this time of drinking the juice and eating the bread. If you do not have any communion elements this morning, there are some by the main doors on the silver platter there. You can grab those. And now would be the time to go do that. We need some this morning. Romans chapter 6, I'll read the first 10 verses and have a few comments before we go into some more songs, uh, worshiping our Lord for what He has done for us. In Romans 6, verse 1, we read, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in His death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. For the life He lives, He lives to God. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Beautiful words. And we've read these before, before communion, and spoken on these, this text before in the past. Uh, just a good reminder for us today about what has happened uh, for us and to us uh, because of the cross. Because of the cross, uh, we were baptized into Christ Jesus. And as we place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, recognizing that we are sinners, we are rebellious against God, and that we are deserving of just punishment for our sin, and that we need to be forgiven, and the only forgiveness that is available to us is through Jesus through his death on the cross, we cry out to him to forgive us, trusting that he is God's son, trusting that his death on the cross did take the penalty for us, for our sins, and that he rose again from the dead, offering us a new life. We have been freed from sin. We are united with Christ. We are united together as the body of Christ, united together with Christ, so that what is true of Christ is also true of us. He died to sin, we died to sin in him. He was raised to new life, we are raised to new life as well. That is true of us spiritually and it will be true of us physically someday. Either at the resurrection Christ's second coming or at the rapture. We've been united with him in his death. We will be united with him in his resurrection. Our old self was crucified with him. We do not go on sinning. We do not go on purposely living our old way of life of sin. We live in this new life that Christ has given us because of what he has done for us at the cross. We have been free from sin its power, from its presence. We look forward to a time when we will be completely sin free. So if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. Death, the death He died, He died to sin once for all. We, as we partake of these elements, we remember what Jesus has done for us. His death upon the cross for bearing my sin your sin, our shame, our guilt. When he died to 
punishment, he was forsaken by God so that we would not be forsaken, so that we could experience life eternally with him, both now and forever. So this is a time where believers, those who have placed their full faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, accepted the forgiveness that he offers through his death and resurrection. Because of that, trusting him as Lord and Savior, as the Son of God who came to earth to be represent who God is for us and to die on that cross on our behalf. We partake of this as a way of remembering. It doesn't do anything special within us. It's just a way of us honoring the Lord, remembering what He has done, proclaiming what He has done for all so that they too might know Christ. Let's take our hymnals now if we could please. And let's worship our Lord and Savior Jesus for what He has done for us at the cross. Hymn number 203 or on the screen the first and fourth verse. And...
um, typically we do take a uh, benevolent offering. There are offering plates up here at the front pew. If you would like to leave one that you need today, uh, please feel free to do so. Those gifts are given uh, to those within our church, within our community, uh, for those in need, and sometimes it's an outreach opportunity as well. Uh, recently we have helped, um, our church has helped with uh, lunches for children and uh, families in North Korea. The school is not able to pay for lunches uh, as they normally would do through the month of August, so we contributed to that happening. And uh, over 40 families and kids were um, helped with those lunches, so part of that was given by our benevolent offering and missions offering to us. So thank you for your contributions. They are going to uh, help spread the love of Christ. Take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Genesis chapter 2 for our message today. And we'll be reading several verses, but Genesis 2 is where we're going to launch from this morning. Going back to the beginning, it is amazing how many foundational truths, of course, and how many things that we deal with in our society, and the scriptures and things, always come back sooner or later to the beginning, what God did in the very beginning. And Genesis is such an important book for us, and we need to continue to look to it for wisdom and uh, dealing with and answering some of the topics and issues in our day and age. This morning, God-given liberty, from Genesis chapter 2, uh, 16 and 17, and we'll look briefly at Mark 12, 13 through 17 as well. Uh, God-given liberty. God has given people the freedom and responsibility to make choices. Just yesterday, I read a part of an article. I did not get a chance to read the whole article, but I read enough to know that Sudan, a nation in Africa, has proclaimed itself to be a nation that upholds religious freedom, which is groundbreaking news. I don't know why it wasn't scattered all over everywhere, but uh, Sudan has been an Islamic nation under Sharia law for decades, if not longer. And Islam was the only religion that could be practiced. Christians, about 6% of the population, were persecuted heavily uh, in Sudan. They've gone back and forth with civil wars. There's been various rebellions. And uh, the church has had some times of uh, not being as persecuted as other times. But this is uh, groundbreaking that this Islamic nation would realize that there is a benefit to religious freedom. And it will bring much peace flourishing and prosperity to that nation. They are in desperate need of it. And so I thought, well, that is just so timely because what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the basis of freedom, of liberty, especially religious liberty, religious freedom. And that is becoming a big, big topic in our world today, especially in our nation, especially as the election gets closer and closer. And uh, as many of our elected officials are uh, trying to promote religious freedom, both within and without our country, and others are trying to not make a big deal out of it uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think we need to recognize that, and I think we all know, and we are all here today, partly because of the fact that our nation has been a nation that was at least partially founded on the idea of religious freedom. Uh, the original settlers, many of them, came to this new world escaping religious persecution from state-run churches in England and France and Germany, Spain and Portugal, and all of the religious wars that had happened throughout the centuries prior to that, they were looking for a place to just worship God freely without bothering anybody else. It didn't always work out as perfectly as they hoped, but uh, we had our issues here even. Uh, some Baptists in the 1700s were actually put into prison for baptizing Duncan people and uh, other things as well. And so, um, religious persecution is not entirely gone, but it's overall, people came to this nation partly because of religious freedom. And so it was put into our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty. The ability, the freedom to choose what I think is good and right and best for my life. As far as it goes without injuring or hurting others, of course. The preamble of our Constitution, some time later, uh, says, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, 
establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. They understood the blessings of liberty, that liberty brings prosperity and flourishing and peace. Whether or not it can be truly argued that our nation is founded as a Christian nation, it is unmistakable that Christian influence, biblical influence, was surrounded and involved in almost everything within the beginning of our nation. You can't deny that it is there. In fact, the new constitution would not even be accepted by the people, by the states, unless there was a Bill of Rights, which includes the First Amendment, that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. It was so important to our early nation that we have religious freedom, religious liberty, that we as a people would not have a state-established religion, that we would not have a government run by a religion, that people can choose to worship freely or not. As Christians, we understand that liberty, that freedom, true freedom, is found solely in knowing Jesus Christ. Freedom from sin, freedom from our sinful nature, our old self, with the power of the Holy Spirit within us and God's Word guiding and directing us and other believers helping us to be accountable and maturing ourselves and helping each other to grow in Christ. We can experience true freedom be able to live the way that God has wanted us to live. And that has been carried out to a certain extent through the civil laws of our nation and allowing people to be able to choose yes, I want to worship this way or no, I don't want to worship this way. And that has brought great prosperity and comfort and peace to our country for as long as we have been around. Yes, there have been issues and there are issues today. There are still arguments and such. We're not going to be able to address all those. This is very general. I understand that. But we must realize that true freedom comes, first of all, in knowing Christ as Savior. And that a nation in which their government respects and responds to and upholds and protects religious liberty is a nation that will experience much blessing and prosperity. In recent months, because of the COVID crisis and because of uh, what's happened with uh, civil unrest in our nation, religious freedom has been thrown right back out into the spotlight once again. Christians especially, there are churches in our nation today that are being, I don't know if persecution is the right way to put it, but just for lack of a better word, they are being pressured by uh, local governments to not meet for a variety of reasons. There's been a lot of pushback and a lot of arguments and debates uh, about who's right, who's wrong, should they open, should they not open, you know, all of these different questions. But to truly address this, I think we need to go back to the beginning and get a basic understanding of what the scriptures say about liberty, especially religious liberty, and the government's role regarding human freedom and liberty. So we go back to creation. We go back to the time when God created Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. The context here is that Adam is in the garden, and God has told him to take care of it, to so count He's going to tell him to name the animals and all that kind of stuff. But he says to him in verse 16, the Lord commanded the man. First of all, this is the first time we hear God say that in the scriptures. This is the first command that God gives to Adam. The first thing that he's told that he can and cannot do. And he says to him, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So all these trees here you see, Adam, you can eat from all of these hearts to life. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This one tree you should not eat from it. But when you eat of it, you will surely die. In that verse right there, verse 17, God has shown us that he gave Adam freedom to choose. He allowed Adam the opportunity to say, I'm going to love you, God. I'm going to, you have created me. You've given me this beautiful place to live. And I have something to do. It's a purpose. It's wonderful. This amazing creation that you've given. I'm just going to keep worshiping you. And I'm just going to do everything you say because you are so awesome and so wonderful. And Adam could have done that. But Adam and Eve, as we know in chapter 3, they're tempted to look at that tree. 
isn't that, doesn't that look good? You want to eat that, don't you? Oh, you won't sure to die. God's just messing with you. He knows that you'll be like him, and he doesn't really want that, you know. So they're deceived, and they give in to temptation. They take from the fruit. They choose to do what God said not to do. God gave them that choice. And they chose to disobey. The freedom of choice given to God from the very beginning. This is one of the ways in which humanity is like God. The ability to choose, to make a rational thought and decision. God wanted humans to love and obey Him freely and willingly. Not because they had to, but because He is so awesome and so wonderful. There's nothing greater than God Himself. Even His most awesome creation, this world that was free from sin, was nothing compared to the beauty and majesty of God. And he wanted them to be able to say, I love you because of who you are. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. So God, quote unquote, took a risk. He made us in his image and gave us the right to choose. We would obey him for that. This is how God desired for us to learn. Humanity alone has the potential for crossing moral boundaries. This one was simple. Don't eat from that tree. And he told them why. This is what's going to happen. You're going to die. And we could spend the rest of the message just talking about what that means. But for now, we just know that that means physical and spiritual death, separation from God. He gave them a choice. One led to continued blessing and long life. The other choice led to death, physically. This freedom of choice will continue to carry over into the rest of human history. People will be given the choice to choose to know God and to follow God in His ways or not. This is also the basis for the commands that God is going to give to Israel, the Ten Commandments and others. Will you choose to follow me? Will you choose to be what I have created you to be, what I want you to be? What you can be when you surrender your life. And this continues, this idea of choice, freedom, of religion, freedom, of uh, deciding to obey God or not throughout biblical history. As you can see in your notes, if you have them with, there with you, several verses. I'm going to read just a few of them there. You can look up these other ones, but their context. Exodus 22, this is where God is on Mount Sinai with Moses, and he's just about ready to give them the Ten Commandments. And he says, remember, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. They knew what it meant to be slaves, to not be able to choose for themselves. They were oppressed. They needed to be freed. They cried out to God, and God freed them through Moses and his deliverance and his obedience and doing what God called him to do. Here. So before he even gives them their, his ways of living for righteousness and, and how to honor him, show the world that he is real and that he exists. He says to them, remember, I brought you out of slavery. Now, this is the way to live in freedom. And that's partly what those laws were meant to do, to show the, the Israelites that, yes, there is sin in this world, and people are going to choose to do bad things, but the more that you follow these guidelines, these rules, these commandments, you will find blessing and prosperity. In giving the Ten Commandments to Israel, God reminded them of the freedom he's brought them to slavery and oppression he rescued them from. What will they now do with the freedom he's given them? Will they follow his commands and find life, or will they reject him and find death? Later on in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, God provides an opportunity called the year of Jubilee for those who were enslaved, owned by a fellow Israelites, whether, whether or not they would be set free or not. Every six years, slaves were to go free, and at the 50th year of Jubilee, everybody was to go free. Property was to be restored, and basically an overall reset to society to provide freedom and liberty and the continuation of their way of life. In the Deuteronomy passages, Moses is instructing the children of the people that were rescued from Israel, or from Egypt, excuse me, Again, giving them the choice between life and death, blessing and sin, or judgment. And we know that right away, they're like, yes, we will follow God. We will do these things. And they even, once they got into the promised land, half the people were on one mountain, half the people were on the other. One said, this is what will happen to us if we obey God. These are the blessings that will happen. And the other half said, these, this is the judgments. This is what will happen to us if we disobey God. 
and they experienced a little bit of the blessing, and they experienced, unfortunately, a whole lot of the judgment. Eventually, Israel being split into two nations, Israel and Judah, and both going into exile. Joshua and Judges shows that Israel was continually given the opportunity to choose to serve the Lord, and they continually chose against serving the Lord. They did their own thing. What they saw was right to their own lives. When they didn't choose to follow and obey God, chaos and death were what they experienced. The idea of religious freedom, of freedom of choice, continues even through the prophets with a prophecy in Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, the Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. And there's a, a kind of a dual thing going on there, where there's a physical aspect to this, but there's also a very much a spiritual aspect, especially when Jesus reads this in the synagogue, and he says, I am going to accomplish this. He brings true freedom for those who are captive to sin. The prophecy of the Messiah and what he's going to do ultimately fulfilled in Christ. The freedom he offers us from sin and eternal punishment from sin by faith in him and his work on the cross is what brings true liberty. Sometimes we forget what we have in Christ because we live it almost every single day. But in a lot of it, it's in America, especially because of our heritage, we sometimes don't realize that some people do actually kind of live a life that almost makes it look like they are Christians. But they're not. Sometimes we Christians, we aren't living as separated of a life as we should in our freedom in Christ. And we have been given a tremendous privilege in knowing Christ and being able to live and have victory over sin in our lives what it means for us as a nation to be able to, to do this, what we are doing here today, to not have to cower in a basement, to not have to worry about, you know, the government telling us, this is what you have to do for your service pastor, this is what you can teach and what you can't teach. We don't have to worry about that. This prophecy that was given in Isaiah was given at a time when Judah and Israel did not have any true political or religious liberty. They were constantly under attack, sent in, finally sent into exile by the Assyrians and the Babylonians due to their disobedience to God. To God. They chose to sin, so they suffered their sin. The New Testament carries out some of the same ideas forward, especially from the spiritual dimension. We see here that Jesus, in Matthew 11, and in John, and in Revelation, invites people to follow him place their faith in Him. Nowhere in the scriptures do we see God as saying at any time that it's a good thing to force anybody to, to trust Him as Savior, to, to seek forgiveness of sins. It's always an invitation. It's always placed before people as an option. You can do this, or you cannot. This is what will happen if you do, and this is what will happen if you don't. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you that come to me. That's an invitation. Come to me. He's pleading. Come. Please come. I can give you forgiveness of sins. I can give you healing. I can give you eternal life. If you would come and seek rest in me. Part of that rest is following him. Placing our faith in him and following him and his teachings and his commands. Loving him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In John 5, 39 through 40, Jesus is teaching him. He's being questioned by the religious leaders. He says to them, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. They did not want to have anything to do with Jesus. They chose, in their freedom to choose, they chose against Jesus as the Son. In fact, they put him to death because he claimed to be the Son. In Revelation 22, said, 17, again we see Jesus, the Spirit, the Bride, the Church, saying to those who have not yet come, come, put your faith in Jesus, the Spirit of salvation, come and turn them Again and again, throughout the Bible, God offers liberty and freedom to choose. Through choosing to seek and to follow Him by His Word and His Son. 
we hurt ourselves when we as believers and unbelievers choose to live without God and His truth. When we think, I can just go my own way, I can just, this is what I think about this, and I don't care what anybody else thinks, even the Bible, I'm just going to, this is what I think is right, and I'm going to do it. That's what brings pain and suffering. We continue to believe, like Adam and Eve, that true freedom is found apart from God instead of with God. That choice brings death and chaos, suffering and sadness and loss. And a loss of truly great opportunities for change. And I think we've seen that throughout world history. Even in recent times, the past 120, 150 years, nations that have allowed religious freedom have been nations that have prospered and been blessed. And nations that have squashed religious liberty and forced people to reject all religion or to be forced into one religion. They have been oppressive regimes and people have died by the millions. And yet people at times want to stress that those forms of government are better than what we have now, even here in America. Freedom brings greater prosperity and blessings. That freedom must be changed. There must be a government that says, you know, these things are right and good for us. This will help us to continue to move forward. And if we're wrong, we'll correct things. <laughs> we hope that they see that. So what does this mean, this brief run through the scriptures, this brief looking at a basic understanding of what that God gives us freedom to choose? What does this mean for us even here today? The implications of God given liberty, especially for governments and for American Christians. First of all, we've got to remember and understand and respect that God honors and protects human freedom and choice. Freedom of individual choice is viewed favorably again and again in the scriptures. It is a component of what it means to be fully human. We have the ability to choose. God even protects the freedom to choose against Him. He never forces anybody to do what He wants us to do. He does hold each person accountable, though, for our actions. We choose to do something, there will be consequences. We will be what we sow. For good and for bad. We cannot think that we can do whatever we want. And that's part of the reason why there are governments. God has established a government system that said, government, you have the power to check evil in your area of influence. And that is a good thing. Otherwise, it would be like the days of Noah. People just did whatever they thought was right. The days of judges. Government is necessary to help check evil choices and encourage good ones. And one of those good ones is religious liberty. Liberty is an essential component of humanity. A government that significantly denies people liberty exerts a terribly dehumanizing influence on its people. It brings so much oppression. A loss of hope, a loss of joy. Which is why we see a lot of people trying to escape their oppressive governments and come to the United States. It's one of the reasons why there needs to be some sort of a good immigration system so that people can find freedom. Refugees can find hope and freedom again in the land where they can have an opportunity to choose for themselves to how to best live their lives within the proper laws of course, biblically and civilly. Slavery and oppression are viewed negatively in the Bible. Slavery and oppression is never something that God approves of. He limits it in His laws to His people Israel, and in doing so, He's given us every reason to not practice it, but eventually to eliminate it. Jesus did not come necessarily to free His people from Rome or to set uh, to correct all of the social evils that were happening in the Roman Empire. There was slavery, there was a lot of evil, adulterous, immoral things that were happening in the Greek and Roman empires and ever since then. But Jesus knew that none of that was going to matter. Changing none of, all of that wouldn't matter unless there was a possible way to change the human heart. Repentance. A new heart given to us by God through our faith in Christ. Recognizing our sinfulness. The fact that we have sinned and we are sinners. And we need to be that has to happen first before anything else would be. As Christians in a society, we can work within the framework of our government to eliminate oppression and injustice. And Christians should be involved in governments and in organizations and groups that are trying to do things like end human slavery 
to end abortion, to end other things that are evil and wrong in this world that is good for us to do. I think of uh, William Wilberforce in England and how he for decades fought in Parliament to end the slave trade and then to end slavery itself. It took him a long time, but through his influence, through politics, and through a mostly good reputation of godliness and Christ-likeness, they brought about the end of slavery. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that in our nation. It took a war to truly end slavery. But there were people who were fighting against slavery, fighting for abolition in our nation. And there have been other evils and ills in our nation that have been uh, fought against by people who believe in Christ. And that is good. We should pick up those mantles where it is appropriate. God wants humanity to flourish. And when we do, we are given a tangible look at what God wants and can do. So, I believe that the scriptures teach that governments should protect people's liberty in all areas of life. We've looked at Romans chapter 13 just a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at how God establishes governments to an order so that people can flourish, so that there's good for people. And when there's evil that happens, governments are set up to halt that. We need to do that. Sin needs to be checked where it will just run rampant and cause all sorts of pain. Governments should allow religious freedom. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Of course, not all governments choose to do this, because many governments are very selfish, and once people get in power, they don't want to let go of power. They want to rule and reign and control everything about everybody's life. But that is not the way that things should be. In Romans, or not Romans, Mark chapter 12, we have an account here of Jesus being questioned by the Pharisees and the Herodians and Sadducees. People are trying to track Jesus so that they can find a way to accuse him and get rid of him. And so a bunch of them come together and they ask Jesus, in verse 14, We know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're trying to butter Jesus up for a good question. They, they want him to do what they want him to do. So they're trying to track Jesus. Um, he says, is, they say, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? This was a big deal in this time period, okay? The Jews were being ruled by the Romans and they hated it. And of course they should hate it because they were being oppressed to a large degree. And so they fought against it every time they could. In fact, some people, religious people especially, they would not even carry Roman coins with them because they didn't want to have anything to do with Romans. But look at what Jesus says. He knows their hypocrisy. He knows that they're trying to track him. And they know that they aren't as uh, all in against Rome as they thought they were. Why are you trying to trap me? He asks. Bring me a denarius, which was a Roman coin, and let me look at it. They brought the coin. Somebody in that group of really highly religious people who really hate Rome, don't want to have anything to do with Rome, they had a coin on it. They shouldn't have but they did. And so they give it to Jesus. He looks at it. Whose portrait is it on the one side? And whose inscription? And of course, they say it is Caesar's. And then Jesus gives his famous line, and give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And they were amazed. Just a simple phrase. And Jesus sets the whole thing up. And a lot of people have tried to use this verse to justify a lot of things that probably aren't really justifiable by this verse. But one thing is clear that Jesus does show is that there are things that civil governments have authority over. And so you've got to deal with that and you've got to do that. Okay? Deal with it. If Rome wants taxes, then you've got to pay the taxes. But there are things that belong to God. There's an image on that coin, the image of Caesar. And it says something to the fact that Caesar is the son of God and is worshiped and that kind of thing. But Jesus says, give to God what is God's. What is God? Who has God's image? Humanity does. Men, women, and children. We are made in God's image. We, through our whole life, are to honor God. Give Him our respect and acknowledge. That is what Christ, that is what God expects of us. And what does this mean for working as Christians with government? And looking at what our government should and shouldn't do. Government should allow religious freedom. Should allow people who are made in the image of God to be able to choose, are we going to follow God or not? Are we going to seek Him out and seek forgiveness of sins through Jesus according to His word? 
It allows people to flourish, provides an ethic and moral compass that guides people to live. It can make even the task of governing a lot easier if people have a self-governing thing by God and His Spirit according to His Word. Governments should not rule over our religion. They have their area of influence that they are to stay within. They are not to tell people how they are to worship God and or should worship God or anything like that. That's not Caesar's realm. That's not the role of government. Governments don't rule over religion. Consider in Acts and in the pastoral epistles about who governs a church, who selects its leaders. It's not the civil government, but Christ, through His Spirit, through His people, through His Word. Christ calls the Spirit commends them and presents them to the church. The church, uh, through whatever process that church has developed to do that, recognizes, yes, we believe you have been called by God to lead this church. The government doesn't have anything to do with that. In fact, when the government has had something to do with that in the past, there has been major issues and a major, major oppression coming upon people. And this does not mean that governments can't create laws to protect people in a nation that will affect the church. Ever heard of building codes? Why are there building codes? Construction people out there, why are there building codes? So we don't have this bad building, right? There's a standard. This is the basic bottom line for safety. And that includes churches too. Because we want to make sure that everybody's safe who comes into that building for as long as that building is sound. To be. And there are other such things that affect us as a church. Where the government has said, we need to do these things. Because it's good for everybody, whether they're in your church or not. We need to recognize this. We need to be very careful when we say, uh-uh, government, we're not going to do that. You've gone too far. Have they really? Let us check ourselves and be careful. We do not get to choose which laws we want to obey or disobey. We always obey God's law. We always obey God's law. We've got to be very careful when we say, government, uh, you've gone too far. Religion should not rule over or in government. Government should never be used to force people into or out of a religion. We must be careful that we don't try as a Christian group, a Christian church denomination, to try to bring the kingdom of God to earth through the means of civil government. Because that's not how God has said his kingdom is going to come. He's going to bring his kingdom through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As people are saved from their sins, and they come into the church, and as we live the life of the body of Christ, Amongst the world that we live in, people see their need for Christ. And I know I'm very much simplifying this. And they come to faith in Christ. And God's kingdom begins to be established. But Christ will come and bring his kingdom when he finally comes in the second time to annihilate all of Satan's forces against his people. Civil religion is not a good thing either. A religion that we have kind of sort of had throughout the past hundred years or so in America. Where everybody just goes to church because it's the thing to do and it just makes you look good. You can get a better business deal because you make good contacts with people, that kind of stuff. That is a bad, bad thing. And I think we are seeing a day today in our day and age where more and more people who come to church on a regular basis who are about the body of Christ, who are truly about the gospel, are truly more likely believers than we've seen in the past. There's a danger in any religious group. Christian or not, gets too cozy with the government, with a particular political party or a particular political leader. You've got to be very careful that we don't blend the two together. All right, One political party does not own the scripture, does not own Jesus, does not own Christianity or the church. And it shouldn't be the other way around either. There may be things within a particular party, within a particular leader that's elected that may agree more so or more not so with the scriptures. That does not mean that they are owned, vice versa, in your way. Just to be because you're a Christian does not necessarily mean that you're a Republican, or a Democrat, or a Libertarian, or anything else. We're Christians and follow Christ, first and foremost. Religion, denominations, Christians, other faiths, should support good government and critique bad government. We're submissive to our governments until governments force us to be disobedient to God. When we submit to government, we do so to be obedient to God, not because we think our government is all that awesome and great. It's not God. The government is not God. The government is not going to save us. Just look 
in any government's history can see that government really messes things up more often than they get things right. Government is not our saving Jesus is our Savior. But yet we are submissive because we submit to Christ, we submit to God and His authority in our lives. There are checks and balances, there are boundaries. Each has our own sphere of influence. And there's some overlap there, of course. We've got to recognize that we've got to seek wisdom through the Word, be guided by the Spirit to make the decisions that God should have us to make as His people, as His church. God given the God has given us a choice. Many of you here today have chosen to follow Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the best choice that you could ever make. If you haven't made that choice, to trust Jesus as your Savior, to accept the forgiveness of sins He offers you through the cross, I trust and pray and beg that you would do that today and find true freedom. To be able to live in this world following Christ, being blessed, and being able to have the wisdom and discernment to choose how to best live your life here. Looking forward to having the hope for what we have together in the rest of the future. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to know you. The ability uh, to seek you out through your word, through those who know you and trust you. You have given us a choice all the way through your, your word, even from the very beginning. Life or death to know you is to have eternal life. And I pray, Father, that those of you, those of us who know you are here today, that we would truly experience life, that we would truly surrender our lives to you, following your will and your way according to your word, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to show the rest of the world that you are real, that you are good, that you are loving, compassionate, and gracious, and that you have offered a way to escape death, Oppression, true oppression and evil in this world by knowing Christ is Give us the courage to share the gospel. We thank you, Father, for the freedom that we are given in this nation that is recognized and protected here in our country. We pray that you would help us to not take it for granted, but to live within the opportunity that we have so that others might know true freedom in us. Father, help us to properly, to wisely, Discern through your word and through your spirit when our governments do good and our governments do bad, and to appropriately let them know. To not worship our government, but to look to it as something that is necessary, that is not always the best, and to do what we can to help it be as good as it can for everyone. Father, there are many people of many different faiths in our country, and Father, we are thankful that they do have the opportunity to be free to choose to believe what they wish, and we pray, Father, that they would see the truth of the gospel through our example. As we talk and discuss with people and teach people, we pray that they would see the truth as they are led by your Spirit and come to faith in Christ. Father, give us guidance and wisdom, especially as we head into a greater election time when campaigns are wrapping up and there's advertisements and promotionals and all this talk about what this candidate is going to do or not do or what that candidate did or didn't. Help us to see through all the noise, Father, to see the truth, and to choose as best we can, Father, according to your will and plan, who you would have to be as our nation's leaders. Father, we pray for those leaders who are in power right now. We pray for wisdom for them. We pray for your guidance, directing as you have said you can and do according to your will. We pray, Father, that your will would be done, that you would be honored and glorified, so that all people might find the true blessing and prosperity through knowing you living the life that you have created this day. We praise you, Father, for all that you've done and for all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Take your hymn notes for our closing hymn, please. Precious Lord, take my hand. Hymn number 463.
brothers and sisters, this blessing, this prayer upon us today. To the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, and all that we do and say.